about what's going on with with the next uh, the sequel, the the sun. Is that something that's that's actually going forward, or is that what you're plotting right now? It's true that the father was a play, and it was part of a trilogy with the mother and the son. And I'm um, I'm hoping to to do the son next as a film. Excellent, excellent. And I understand that you've cast uh, someone we know uh, in in the in the in the film. <laughs> How do you know that? <laughs> he told me. He told me last time we spoke. <laughs> yes, of course. Of course, of course. So I love the story of how you um, decided to take this extraordinarily successful play, Le Père, and uh, that was a, a big hit in, in, in many places, including Paris and London and New York, where Frank Langella won the Tony for this, for this role. Um, and I wondered if, if, if and when you, how did you come up with Christopher Hampton? And why did you name the rename the lead character Anthony? So uh, Christopher, um, he's the one who translated all my plays in English. Ah. So we had this relationship and this friendship together. We shared so many moments together in in London or in New York uh, through those plays. So we were very connected. And even though um, I'm French, as you can hear, and he is English. In a way, we speak the same language. We understand each other very, very well. And when I started to dream about making that film, I, I, I really wanted to do it in English because I, have, I had this um, dream and this conviction that I wanted to do it with Anthony uh, because I knew that he would be extraordinary in it. And so that's the reason why I had to do it in English. And because I'm French, uh, it was very helpful for me to, to do it with Christopher, talking about the, the writing, because I wanted to make sure that it was really, um, you know, English. And, and also because what I didn't want to do is to, to film a play. And I thought that to, to, to work with someone else was the best process to, to make sure that I was not defending just my play, but I, was, I wanted to go to the cinema and to do what the cinema can do and what only the cinema can do. So that's the, the reason. Sir Anthony, when you saw his, his play and the character was your name and, and your, even, even your date of birth, what, 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 what did you think? Well, it was such a perfect script, if there's anything such as perfect, but it was pretty near perfect. And it's the clarity and the, um, the compactness of it that, uh, that it got my attention straight away. And it came out of nowhere, you know, it came out of the blue. It came out from left field. My agent sent it to me, said, would you like to read this? I said, yeah, I read it. And I thought, my God, that's one of those experiences when you think this is it. Uh, I want to do it. So because what is, what is so good about it? It was written so simply, but no fanfare of the Hollywood, you know. And it was a, a small independent film, and it was French. I read it and I phoned my agent to say, I'd love to do it. And then Florian and Christopher Hampton came out and we met in Los Angeles at a hotel for breakfast. And he said, uh, we want you to do it. And I was thrilled, I really was. I think it was the lack of ceremony, the unceremonious, the uh, lack of you know, Hollywood. It was the simplicity of having breakfast. We want you to do this, I said, okay. And those meetings happen once in a lifetime, once very rarely. Let's do it. Should we do it? Yes. Okay. And I'd had two experiences recently before that um, to do the dresser with um, Richard Eyre and say Ian McKellen and King Lear. And they were both unceremonious, quiet events. Let's get it together and do it. And that was what the dresser and the, the father was exactly that. I'm not the only one who's, who has has wondered how much King Lear plays into this play. Uh, how how ha, have you thought about him a lot in in writing him and playing him? And you've played King Lear memorably, so you had some practice. Well, I'm 83. I was 80 when I played Lear. I played it 20 years before, many years before that. I was too young. I was in my 40s. But by the time I played it recently in 2017, I think. I was old enough, well, 83 years, more experience of life, more understanding of age, more understanding of mortality and all the rest of it. And 
so it was easy. And a great director in Richard Eyre, truly great director. Very simple, like, like, like uh, Florian, very simple to direct and a uh, great cast. And that was it. And the dresser with Ian McKinnon, again, straight down the line. You follow the roadmap of the script and the director and it's easy. It really is easy. It's not difficult. And then this one, the father with Florian, it's his, his first directorial job. And it was easy. It was a pleasure every day. And the wonderful thing about it is the smallness of it. Small cast, small set, everything. So I didn't have to do any work. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's true. I think, I think you've learned a lot and you are canny and wily and you yes. know how I'm to make it interesting. You, you roll with it, you know? I mean, you go under it. And you, oh, and you make it interesting. Well, you have to, I mean, you, for an actor, my only theory about acting is I don't know, I don't know anything much, but you have to have confidence. You have to be sure, confidence, nothing to do with ego. You have to know what you're doing. It's like driving a car, playing tennis, or being a singer or being a dancer. You have to know what you do, or being a carpenter. You have to know the technique. My technique is very simple. Learn the text. Stop think, overthinking and learn the text. Once you've absorbed and eaten the text, or it's like eating oatmeal for breakfast, you have the oatmeal, you're not the oatmeal, but when you eat, when you devour, eat the te have the text, the text becomes part of you for those days. So you just follow the impulses and the director's suggestions, and then you listen. Laurette Taylor, the great American actress, she said, um, the art of acting is listening. And um, she did uh, The Glass Menagerie, she was spellbound because she listened. She just listened to the other actors and responded. Anthony says that it was easy, and I'm sure it's true. But I also feel that he's very humble uh, as an actor. And because the challenge was also for him uh, to explore this emotional territory and in a way to be connected with uh, the feeling of mortality. And I mean, personally, I'm, I'm really grateful, of course, but my admiration for what he did is immense because, you know, I think it was brave to go to that place, you know, this very emotional, fragile, vulnerable place, because it was not, you remember in our process, it was not about creating a character, talking about the, the character. It, it was more something more in, instinctive in a way. What, what I was hoping is for Anthony just to be in front of the camera. It was not about creating a character, faking, um, the disease, you see what I mean? It was just about tr trying to be as connected as possible to truth, uh, truthful feelings and emotions. And that's why the, I really wanted the, 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 the main character's name to be Anthony. It was not only because I, I thought of Anthony writing the script, it was also because I wanted to, in a way, to have that door that we could open anytime, you know, for all our secret and personal feelings to overwhelm the whole film. So when you um, worked with Hampton, I am curious about how that worked logistically. Where were you and how did you communicate with one another as you wrote the script? And he was a screenwriter opening up a screenplay for, for your play that, that was different from the play. You used production design and you used other markers in a, in a different way than you had done before, right? Yes. I mean, I wanted the father to be not only a story, but to be an experience in a way, to be the experience of what it could mean to lose everything, including your bearings. And I wanted to find a visual way to tell that story. Uh, and, and that's why, as you said, we worked a lot with Peter Francis, the, the production designer, to, to, with, with the space, you know, because most of the time we think that memory, uh, that memory is to do with um, the time, but it's also, it has to do with space as well. And, and when you think about adapting a play into a film, you know, the first ideas you have is always to write new scenes outdoors to make it feel more cinematic. But here, I really wanted to, to stay in this apartment so that that space could become like a mental space and to play with it in order to, to make the audience experience this feeling of disorientation. And uh, so as, Anthony said we were in a small studio 
uh, in West uh, London. It was really an independent film. And um, it's important for us to tell it. It was really something that we had to fight uh, to make it happen. You know, it's, it's never easy to, uh -huh. to, to finance and to make it happen, a, a film like that. And, and as you probably remember, at the beginning of the story, we are in this apartment, in Anthony's apartment. There is no doubt about it. You recognize the space, the knickknacks, and the pieces of furniture. And step by step, always in the background, you have some small changes or small metamorphoses on set so that you, you recognize where you are. And at the same time, you understand that something had happened. You cannot tell what happened exactly, but something had happened and you know where you are, but at the same time, you don't know exactly where you're not anymore. And it was a way for me to use the cinema to, to play with this feeling of disorientation. It's brilliant the way you change the actors around so that we're always unsettled and we don't know. I mean, you don't know who they are and neither do we. We even been introduced to Olivia Coleman as your daughter. We're all set, she's going to Paris. You think you know that. And then the next woman who shows up is someone completely different. How is this, was it similar on stage when, when you did that? Uh, not exactly. But it was the same, the, the strategy was the same, meaning the desire to put the audience in this unique position, as if the audience was trying to go through that labyrinth. Because what I wanted is the audience to be in an active position. You know, I didn't want the audience just to sit and watch a story already told, but to, to have to, to, to go through that labyrinth and to try to figure it out, try to think, to try to have to think about it and to try to make it work, you know, as if the film was a puzzle and you can play with all the pieces of that puzzle to try to make it work. So there's Anthony's, uh, his, his point of view, uh, but there's also the point of view of the daughter. When we're on the daughter, is, is, are we seeing something that is reality? When, when, when it's Olivia Coleman? I, or is it I all guess, fractured parts of his brain? I guess we are, but again, in that puzzle, there is there is no combination that entirely work you know there is always one piece missing so that you you can never completely understand what is the perspective and what is the story it is done on purpose because what i wanted for the audience is again is to try to understand and and two pieces the puzzle and then to accept that that your brain is not capable to understand everything you know who is this character and that scene is it before or after so that the moment come when you have to just to let it go. And when you let it go, um, you can understand the whole story on another level, which is a more emotional level. And even though the journey, uh, the narrative is sometimes complex, I think in the end, we lead to a very simple place, very simple emotions. And this is really where I wanted to go, some, some very simple place. So I'm gonna operate on the assumption that most of the people who are seeing this interview have seen the movie. <laughs> and if you haven't seen the movie, we're, we're heading into spoiler territory now. Um, so be, be forewarned. Um, so, and I won't give it away in the story, but we're gonna, we're gonna go to the ending. This is where the true letting go takes place. This extraordinary, crash uh, for, for, for this character. And was that something you had planned as a centerpiece for the film from the start? Yes. Uh, I started dreaming about that film. I mean, it was the real destination of the film. And, 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 and I think, Anthony, we knew that it was uh, the most important scene to, to, to film in a way. Meaning that if it was not as uh, truthful and as powerful as it should be, the whole film would have been a bit pointless in a way. It was really where we wanted to go. So for you, um, you often play very um, strong, forceful, powerful men. And you can see that this man is the, all of those things. But in this scene, did you feel a, a, a kind of, of challenge, a, a letting go, a, a, how did you approach it? Well, it, it was the most uh, it was the most challenging scene because you have to be emotionally ripe for it. But let me just back up a minute about emotion and about acting. When, for example, Mark Gatter slaps me in the face, there's no acting required. But when you get a slap in the face, the, it's naturally because it's a human condition. 
there's a there's a reaction. Well, oh, the market didn't mean to hurt me, but it was a technical slap. It did snap. And that moment is a shock. So it starts the whole mechanism in the brain of a reaction of tears or whatever of fear. So there's no acting required. But with this scene where uh, I get confused over uh, the names of the man who's just left, which Mark Gattis again, and I don't know who she is. And then I say, and who am I? That is enough to create a break in one's own emotional life, although I'm not Anthony, I'm not, you know, I'm just an actor standing there saying those lines. So we did two takes and the first one was a bit difficult and I didn't, and there was, there was, for some reason, I don't know why, the word mummy, meaning my mother, and the, there were three, three words, and I took the liberty of adding one, the wind and the rain. And for some reason in my childhood, the combination of the wind and the rain have some emotional effect on my childhood. For some reason, the wind and the rain. It's so, so I don't know if it's whatever it is, the wind and the rain. It just feels like death and life. And it's like a curtain that's in my consciousness somehow. I don't want to make it too, but it's in me somehow that creates a tremendous I mean, if I read poetry like Alfred Prufrock by T.S. Eliot or whatever, or A.E. E. Houseman, things stir inside one. But it goes back to childhood, I think, and the word mummy. And I remember, I remember the second take we did, Florian was very patient because I went back to the dressing room. I, I wanted to recollect myself. The first take wasn't that good. It was wrong somehow. And when I came back, just, I remember being told when I was five years of age by a boy that we all die. His name was Brian Moore. And I remember the streets. I was crossing the opening in the street in Margam, South Wales, a beautiful Sunday afternoon. He said, we all die. And I remember the shock. Now, as a boy, I was a baby. The, oh, that we all die. Oh, it was like that. The awesomeness that we die. And that... This is all a dream. So those have emotional, powerful effects on me as a person. So those three words, the wind and the rain, the leaves and the rain, the wind and the rain, and mummy, and that's enough to, but also just before we started the take, I noticed on the table opposite the door were the photographs of my daughters, my two daughters and myself in, in the film. And so the reading glasses. And I remember going to the hospital to see my father, get my father's belongings after he died. I went into the ward, into the office of the matron, and I noticed his bed was already occupied by another old man. And I remember that it was 40 years ago. And all those things have a tremendously cumulative effect. And I knew that Florian was going to take the camera past. And that action, that this is it, forever and ever. And it's gone forever and ever. So what was it all a dream, life? And I look at my life now and I think, and I'm convinced that it's all a dream. And I, that's my personal conviction. Because my parents are both dead. Did they ever exist? I've only got photographs of them, maybe a sound recording. But when you look back, there's no proof that any, any of this exists. So that's my peculiar take on life, that it is all an illusion. Because how I got here, sitting here at this moment, is a total mystery to me, from my own childhood. So I'm free in a way, because I cannot take credit for any of it. It's not modesty or hum humility, it's a puzzle to me. And I look at my life and I think, my God, how did any of this happen? And to land a part like the father um, is beyond belief. And I don't mean this in any, you know, whatever the word is silly way, um, it's true. And those emotions are just on the surface because I'm now 83. I'm facing my own mortality. God knows when, I hope I go on for another 20 years, you never know. But that's the wonderful wake up call, you know. 
<laughs> it's so wonderful to hear you talk about this uh, and to see, uh, because, because I'm just going to be honest with you, I'm in the presence of one of the great actors and I can see how it happens when you explain it to me. And I thank you for that. It's, it's extraordinary. And you've taken all of the um, experience and chops and, and muscles that you've built up over all those years and you're using them. And I hope you keep doing it. <laughs> and Florian, it must have been extraordinary to watch for you. I mean, what, what was it like? Did the crew freak out? I mean, what happened? Yeah, it was the most intense and joyful uh, experience of my life. And I was really aware what a chance, you know, just to witness those two amazing actors uh, working together. And, and it was, a, again, it was a playful process because... Uh, we made the decision not to rehearse before we shot the film um, because I wanted to be as far as possible from the theatrical process. I was familiar with the rehearsals, but here I wanted to, to jump into the unknown. And also because I knew that Anthony and, and Olivia were both very instinctive actors. And so every day it was being few people in a room, just going through the scene, trying to to make it as um, truthful and sincere as possible. It was, it was a, a playful process in a way, uh, even though what we were talking about was sometimes sad or, you know, but the process itself was just intense. And in my opinion, beautiful, you know, because we, want to, we, we wanted to, to reach some emotions. And when you feel that it's, it's here, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful feeling. I remember someone telling me, and perhaps they were, were not telling me uh, something in a timely way, but, but, but that you, Sir, Sir Anthony, you can be, you can be very prepared and, and, and very um, controlled about what you're doing. And I've heard that Olivia is way more loose and improvisational. Is, is that, were you able to, to come together uh, as two different kinds of actors or were you on the same, Page. Oh yes, yes. Uh, she well, she's full of life, full of energy, full of cheerfulness, and she's very prepared. She's, uh, you know, she's uh, she doesn't deviate. I mean, what I mean, is she doesn't have that arrogance to rewrite things. Uh, you know, she. But she, uh, in fact, she was very self-contained because her objective was to hold on to her emotions, which then, I mean, if, if you do the opposite. If you cry all the time, then it's not, it doesn't make any sense. It just bores. But she holds back. So when I insult her in front of the young Kara, I said, my wife, I'm going to disinherit you. Uh, and she's trying to hold on because her life is a, now a nightmare because she cannot let go. She's got a responsibility to live her own life and look after this irritating old man because he is irritating. He drives everyone nuts because it's not his fault, but that's what it is. So her complete index of acting is perfect. Um, you know, her lips go, when she starts to cry, she cries because she's holding on. And that's mm -hmm. the wonderful gift, I think, to your work. It's always doing the opposite. It's about control, actually. The more you control emotion, maybe it's a British thing, maybe it's a European thing. <laughs> but, you know, it, it tends to be, oh, we, all go, you know, we all cry. But it's a European thing. There's a wonderful, I must say this, there's a wonderful um, little anecdote about um, Simone de Beauvoir. She came out to Chicago in 1947, and she met Angren, and she, uh, this writer, and the, he took her to all the sleazy joints of Chicago, you know, strip bars and all that, and, uh, and you know, all kinds of them. And he said, what do you think? She said, beautiful. He said, that's the difference between Europeans and Americans. It's either black or white over here, but in Europe, it's all wonderful. And it's all a mixture, potpourri of that's life. And I think with the British way, maybe, that restraint is the thing that moves people. Hold back, hold back. Don't mm. So why do you think um, either of you could answer this? This particular story uh, as a play was an incredible success all over the world. And now it's reaching people uh, as a film. And clearly it, it is. Why is it? so successful what what is it that reaches people it's it's hard to tell and but uh what i think is that you know everyone is related to this issue in a way because everyone has a father everyone has or will have to deal with this kind of dilemma you know which is 
what do you what do you do with the people you love when they are starting to suffer from dementia so i think that's because everyone is related uh, something could be shared and what when it was first on stage i was really surprised and, and profoundly moved to discover the response of the audience it was really powerful meaning that people every night were waiting for us not to say after every performance it was not to say congratulations it was to tell it, it was about telling their own story it was about sharing their own story and i realized that there was something cathartic about it meaning that just to remember that we are all in a way on in, on the same boat you, you see what i mean and i think that there is a consolation a real one and a beautiful one to yeah to to remember that you are part of something larger than yourself. I think art is done for that. And, um, and I think that's the reason, and this is why it is cathartic. And we also know that we're all going to die. <laughs> that's the more <laughs> terrifying truth, we're all gonna die. It's, it's a terminal, life is terminal. And you know, we go through life, can be, be successful. And finally we come to a point and go, oh my God. But that's the truth. And it's a liberating truth in a way because you think, well, if this is it, I may as well enjoy it. And if this, maybe there's something beyond. Who knows? None of us know. Well, I better enjoy it anyway. <laughs> so it's a both double winner in a way. I know they're going to make me stop in a minute, but but Florian, he, you have uh, obviously you have written screenplays, you have written plays. This is your first directorial feature debut. Remarkably proficient. Are they? throwing things at you now? I was really lucky to make that film because it was exactly what I wanted to do. Meaning that I, I never dreamt about making a film. I dreamt about making that film. And it's, I, I, I'm really grateful for that. And thanks to Anthony, because I did what I wanted to do. And, and what I would love to do now, it's to, to try to follow my desire, to still follow my desire. Yeah. So and we're gonna it, go with the trilogy for now, yeah? The trilogy, I don't know, but it's true that the father is part of the trilogy and uh, the son and the mother. And I really want to, to tell the, the son, this is really the story uh, I want to tell. And we have, we have someone to play the father in that movie. And I look forward to it. Thank you, gentlemen. It was my pleasure to talk to you both. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.